Nice to see you all here, those in the room and the 80 or so registered online. You're also equally welcome. My name is Paul Lakeland. I direct the Center for Catholic Studies, and I welcome you to this, the third and last of our Living Theology sessions for this semester. And the uh, event that you are attending is entitled Building a Church that Excludes No One, the U.S. Church and Transgender Policies. Before I hand it over to our uh, chair for the evening, I just want to make a point about questions. So we have the audience here and the audience out there. The audience here, uh, Kevin Malloy here, is going to hand out cards. So if you, if you have a question as the event goes on, write the question down and we'll collect them up and we'll handle the questions that way. If you are online, uh, you will see on your screen in the bottom corner a Q&A button and you can type your question in to that box and I will be uh, collecting those questions for later in the session. Uh, and the thing about online is, the moment it pops into your head, you can write it down. You don't have to wait till the end. And you can be anonymous, or you can uh, put your name in entirely up to you. So that's how we'll proceed. We'll uh, be here for an hour or so. So I think that's all the business. So without any more ado, I'm going to hand over to our uh, MC for the evening, uh, Kevin Malloy from Campus Ministry. Thank you. Good evening, all. Uh, my name is Kevin Malloy. I teach in religious studies. Uh, I use pronouns he, him, and I welcome you this evening. Just before Thanksgiving on Thursday, November 17th, the university community came together to remember those transgender individuals who were killed this year. We have an annual Transgender Day of Remembrance vigil in the chapel. At that service, we lit candles and heard the names of 32 people. Those 32 names and lives represented only the documented cases of anti-transgender violence for this past year. Some three nights later, on the eve of Transgender Day of Remembrance, a gunman killed two more transgender individuals, along with three other members of the queer community in the Club Q massacre in Colorado Springs. These numbers that we recall do not reflect all transgender folks who have lost their lives this year, including folks who have died by suicide, a number we know to be disproportionately higher than the national average. And at the same time, at that event, we celebrate the vibrancy, the resilience, and the creativity of the transgender community. As we all are creatures of a mysterious God, our trans and gender expansive siblings help unravel the infinite mystery of our God and invite us to new and creative ways of being church. In the US, we have an almost constant debate about whether or not rhetoric and legislation are directly tied to acts of violence. We see this most predominantly right now in, in the situation with January 6th, where pundits, politicians, the Justice Department, and individual tweeters are speculating whether or not words spoken in public and in policy can inspire people to commit violence. At the same time in the US, Church, in the U.S. church, dioceses have begun to institute policies regarding transgender people. Some of these policies are public, while others are private internal documents within dioceses. They have real-life consequences for parishes, hospitals, foster care systems, adoptions, and most primarily for schools. Tonight, we will examine these policies, where they are coming from, what they are saying, and what effect they are having on transgender Catholics, their families and allies, our church and our world at large. To frame our discussion tonight, I'd add that this year in Rome, Pope Francis was meeting with a group of Italians who were working for LGBTQ plus inclusion in the church. And Pope Francis encouraged that group to keep working toward, quote, building a church that excludes no one end quote. 
whether or not the church's rhetoric on transgender people contributes to violence against them, or that the targeting of this already marginalized group represents a failure of our gospel mission, we ask tonight, do these policies help build a church that excludes no one? And to aid in that discussion, we are lucky to have two esteemed panelists with us this evening. Robert Schein, he, him, is Associate Director of New Ways Ministry, a Catholic outreach that educates and advocates for LGBTQ plus equality in the church and society, where he has served since 2012. He regularly leads educational programs on issues such as transgender or gen gender identity and Catholicism, the Catholic case for LGBTQ plus non-discrimination, and developing inclusive Catholic schools. Bob is managing editor of Bondings 2.0, a daily blog of LGBTQ plus Catholic news, opinion, and spirituality. He has degrees in theology from the Catholic University of America and the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. Michael Sennett, he, him, is the Director of Communications and Coordinator of Social Justice Programming at St. Ignatius of Loyola Church in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. His passion for LGBTQ plus ministry began while he was in college. In 2018, he graduated from St. Xavier University in Chicago, Illinois, with a degree in communications. He hopes to further study theology. Thank you both for being here. Bob and Michael have graciously agreed to open with some introductory remarks and then answer a few questions that I have prepared for them before turning it over to you all on Zoom and in person to answer your questions. As, uh, Dr. Lakeland said, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and we can give you a card uh, to write your questions so that we can ask them of the panelists. So I turn it over to, to Bob for, for his opening remarks at, with my thanks for being here. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I, uh, when the question was posed to these policies, help us build uh, a church that excludes no one, I thought, it's a very short, short program. No, they do not. We can all go home now. And, um, you know, uh, but, I, but I think what I'd like to do is um, talk a little bit about what, set the context. What are these policies and how can we work to either improve them or resist them uh, depending on the context? Um, so I've been, I've been uh, tracking these policies for about three or four years. And so far, we have nearly uh, three dozen U.S. dioceses that have issued some sort of uh, written document on uh, gender identity. Um, they're, they're primarily or often related to Catholic education, but not exclusively. So think of anything that's going on in the church, not only education, parish life, employment. Uh, these policies tend to be fairly comprehensive. Um, the policies differ in terms of their length, in terms of their tone, their specificity, uh, the intensity of, of the restrictions that are being placed on trans and non-binary people. Uh, so some of them are just like a page or two, and some of them are 25 pages with all the minutia you could think of. And uh, sometimes I, I sit there and wonder, did did some staffer just sit there and think of like every possible situation of a queer or trans person entering the church and then decide to develop a policy on it? Um, so in the most restrictive forms, uh, like the Archdiocese of Denver, which uh, has had a policy for several years that was private and was made public last month, um, the, the, the restrictive ones have a, a wide variety of prohibitions. So, for instance, trans and non-binary students could be denied admission or re-enrollment to Catholic schools. LGBTQ folks are banned from parish ministries. Uh, in extreme cases, um, queer folks have been barred from the sacraments, so they can't receive communion, or uh, as happened in the Diocese of Springfield, folks who were in a same-gender marriage uh, weren't allowed to have funerals at the church. Um, some of these policies mandate that educators or pastoral ministers uh, deliberately have to misgender the people they're serving, so they have to use 
uh, names, pronouns, and identities that uh, might be on legal, rec legal records but are not chosen by the individual uh, student or parishioner. Um, some of these ban any education uh, on LGBTQ topics in Catholic schools, so there's no discussion of diverse sexual and gender identities. Um, some prohibit students from receiving medical care. So uh, if a high school student is receiving uh, hormone treatment, they can't do that on church property, which presents uh, immense difficulties uh, to, to certain students. Um, and then one of the other things that has been um, even longer term uh, than these gender policies is um, church workers, employment contracts, having what are called morality clauses that say you have to abide by different things. You can't go to a same gender couple's wedding or you can't come out or you can't be open that your child is trans, otherwise you can be fired. And in the last 10 years that I've been following these, it's like uh, I think we have 120 public firings um, of, of LGBTQ and ally church workers. Uh, and I would just note, tonight's discussion is on uh, the restrictions being placed on trans and non-binary people in the church, but a lot of these policies also do sort of affect the entire LGBTQ spectrum. Um, for instance, you're looking at prohibitions on same gender prom dates or something like that. Um, they, they, they focus on gender, but then they sort of spill over. Um, a few notes about the policies. So often they have two sections. The first is sort of a guiding principles or catechesis, a teaching section about why the bishop is enacting this. And then the second part would be the specific policies. Um, the first sections almost always rely on a theology of complementarity. So this is the idea that there's only men and women in a very binary form and you have to accept the uh, sex you were assigned at birth, and there is something special or unique to the male-female coupling. Uh, so it's, you know, standard stuff, I guess. Um, but there's also, some bishops take it further. So some bishops have compared being trans to sexual abuse, to disordered eating, uh, to original sin. Um, they, in some ways, have, uh, uh, you know, intensified the rhetoric that is being used against LGBTQ folks. Um, there is an effort in some of these policies to be pastoral, to be compassionate, but that often looks like uh, we should care for this student who has gender dysphoria uh, and help them to accept the sex they were assigned at birth as God created them, rather than affirming their gender. Um, and who they know themselves to be. So um, I don't know if it's quite conversion therapy, but that's often sort of the road that the pastoral dimension of these documents go down. Um, a few more things. One, it's likely we'll see more of these. I know of several that are probably gonna be released in January. Um, so you're, you're looking at a growing number, but I would point out there are 200 uh, Latin Rite diocese in the U.S., and we're talking about maybe 40. So um, this is not the majority of dioceses. There's still an opportunity to do better. Um, and what I want to say is, uh, just to give you a little international context, too, to think about, um, the New Zealand Bishops Conference just put out a wonderful document on guidance about how to deal with trans students. The Australian bishops have done similarly um, the New Zealand bishops focus not on the ethics of sexuality and gender, but their focus is how do you ensure that students or parishioners are treated in a just way. Their emphasis is social justice. Um, in Germany, there's a process called the Synodal Way that has bishops and lay people talking to each other, and they've issued a document um, calling for the bishops to affirm uh, trans, non-binary, and intersex people, uh, and for the church to come out um, in full support. Uh, and they actually have Mara Klein is a non-binary member of this synodal assembly. Um, in other places, Kevin mentioned Pope Francis's outreach. In Italy, uh, there's an archdiocese formally ruled that a trans person could be 
uh, confirmed using their chosen name. Um, and so you, you see, uh, I guess my point is, in the US, it's, it's really kind of uh, a tough situation. But when we're looking for how the church can do better, we have to keep a global perspective because people are doing it better. So I'll pass it over to you, Michael. Thanks, Bob. Um, and thank you, Kevin. And um, welcome, everyone, here tonight. Um, so in terms of um, how the faithful are responding to these policies, it's very difficult to lump the faithful into one category. Um, you know, it's people are all over the lot, and not just on um, the issue of um, transgender policies, but on everything. You know, we know that Catholics disagree about a lot of um, controversial topics like abortion and birth control. Um, but looking at some statistics, um, and this was done by the Pew Research Center, both in 2021 and 2022, and in 2021, it was found that 52% of Catholics believed that gender was determined by sex at birth, um, or sex assigned at birth. And um, now in 2022, the number has jumped to 62%, which has definitely been influenced by um, a lot of the anti-transgender rhetoric that we're seeing and um, hearing as a result of um, the policies that many dioceses are releasing or that are um, influencing them to make these policies in the first place. Um, and, but um, interestingly though, um, for um, the numbers of um, Catholics who believe that society has gone too far with acceptance, that number's at 37%, um, but the number of Catholics who think that society has not gone far enough in accepting um, and supporting transgender people is 34%. So that's actually not too far off. And so that provides a little hope, I think, and um, is showing that the faithful, um, even though they might um, have a belief about what gender and sex are, um, they are willing to realize that we have to care for each person, that, you know, everyone has human dignity and that we need to minister and welcome people. Um, and we see that in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, parishes have LGBTQ ministries and um, so many are doing a lot more to welcome transgender people, um, like with doing vigils or um, services for the Trans Day of Remembrance in November. Um, and I know Kevin mentioned that Fairfield, Fair, Fairfield did um, a service here. And um, the parish I work at, we've done, um, we started doing a Trans Day of Visibility service in um, March because that's when the, that annual day is. And we also, you know, aside from just mourning, the loss um, and feeling a lot of sorrow for the lives who have been taken, which is definitely needed. Uh, we also want to be able to celebrate people being visible and um, recognizing them and giving them the power to be themselves and letting them speak their truth. Um, and, but on the other side of that, then, you know, there are dioceses and different organizations that are coming out really strongly. Um, and, you know, using the rhetoric that uh, transgender people are predators, um, you know, especially with bathrooms. And um, so that fuels a lot of fear. Um, but then there's also so many different Catholic advocates right now. Um, Father Jim Martin, he has been pretty outspoken, mostly on um, LGB issues, but he's beginning to embrace more um, discussion about transgender folks. And Sister Louisa DeRowan, who has ministered to transgender people for over two decades at this point, and she's just starting to step out of that. Um, but she's allowed trans folks and non-binary folks and intersex people to um, speak to different Catholic leaders. For example, in 
2021 in the spring, we, um, I was part of um, a group of transgender people who spoke to Bishop Thomas Zinkula in the Archdiocese of Davenport. Um, it was done through Zoom and we shared our own personal stories and they, the Archdiocese of Davenport used that to shape some of their own guidelines and policies in dealing with transgender people. And I don't think it's any coincidence that they were a lot more positive because I think the biggest, one of the biggest issues is that a lot of these policies, or I would say even um, all of them, have um, lacked the voices of transgender people. Um, we're not invited to the table we're not asked about our own experiences, um, our own faith journeys, um, and it it's very exclusive, and they're only getting that one side of the discussion, uh, the side that they wish to hear themselves, that validates their own point of view. But when folks have been able to meet us and talk and really have a true dialogue, there becomes a mutual understanding that creates a lot better space for transgender Catholics. Um, and I'll say more about all of that too, but that's um, pretty much what I wanted to touch on just to begin with um, and giving the background about how, you know, the faithful are just so split. Um, it's not that everyone's accepting or everyone's rejecting, it just depends um, on where you happen to be, what parish resources you have available to you, um, and the attitudes of people in your area. Thank you both for, for sharing. Um, I have some, some questions for you um, both. I, Bob Shine is what I call a church policy wonk, um, which he hates. But so this question it is for Bob. But Michael, please, if you have any thoughts, it seems to me that individual dioceses, even as you were talking, Bob, forty about forty out of two hundred, and then different policies in New Zealand, Australia, even Germany. Um, it seems very decentralized for what we think is a centralized church, and I'm wondering if you have any kind of idea of why there's no central policy or what the Vatican has to say about any of this um, and what Pope Francis's take on all of this is. Sure. <clears throat> um, I think the Vatican attempted a centralized take. Uh, in 2019, uh, what was formerly known as the Congregation for Catholic Education put out a document called Male and Female, He Created Them. It was supposed to be guidance for Catholic schools on gender. And um, it wasn't as restrictive as a lot of the U.S. policies, but it wasn't good. Um, it, I mean, it was non-affirming. And uh, it, got a lot of, it got a lot of critique. And I think people in Rome heard that critique, realized that they hadn't done a good job. In fact, the, the head of that office uh, acknowledged like a week later, he was like, yeah, we didn't talk to any trans people. I guess we should have done that. Um, so, I mean, they, I think they made a first attempt. They did a poor job. There's been more caution now about um, what the church is to do on this. I think the Vatican is much more willing now under Francis to discern the question, not to rush to judgments and policies, but really figure this out. Um, this is speculation now or, or rumor, uh, but I, I have heard that uh, the Vatican, the US um, bishops conference wanted to put out a centralized document. So wanted to have a national document on gender, and the Vatican actually intervened to stop that. And so what has happened since is bishops who are particularly strong on this are now putting out their own policies. And, uh, and now it seems maybe the Vatican is now trying to stop this in the US with the fear that it will spread to other countries and soon we'll have an explosion of these policies popping up um, in different dioceses around the world. So. Uh, I, I don't 
I don't know. Maybe maybe a, a universal policy is coming, but uh, I don't think so because I think um, people high up, high enough up in the Vatican realize that even for society, questions around gender identity are are newer for society. It's not that trans and non-binary folks just popped up. I don't want to make that claim, but the world is grappling with these questions in a new way. And I think there are church leaders who are saying, you know, we should sit back and listen and learn and try to figure this out before rushing to uh, treat it in a, in a punitive way. Thanks. I don't know if you have anything. No, nothing. Nothing to add about that. Thanks, Bob. Um, Michael, you were sharing that you think, you suspect that zero <laughs> policies consulted any trans Catholics or trans people in the writing of the report or in the writing of their policies and that Davenport did and you think um, it was Davenport, right? Yeah, Davenport, Davenport did and it, it came out to be a little more affirming or a little more careful and caring um, because they spoke to trans folks. Can you share a little with, with folks um, what you think like the real life cost to these restrictive policies are um, for trans Catholics, their, their parents, their families. Um, I'm thinking primarily of the Archdiocese of Denver, which explicitly bans trans uh, youth from Catholic schools and uh, actually denounces or denounces the idea of parents affirming trans children as a healthy um, way of parenting. What, what's the real life cost here? I think the um, immediate concern with cost that comes to mind is um, the loss of so many innocent lives, um, especially to suicide. Um, it's no surprise that um, the suicide rate for trans people and trans youth especially is so high um, because you know people are being told to reject their loved ones, um, that it's, you know, being who they are is wrong. Um, it's disordered. And so that, I mean, you're telling people to reject the dignity of another person, um, and that's extremely tragic. Um, and I mean, other co um, consequences that come out of that are um, a strained fa family relationships um, a lot of trauma, um, people feeling isolated, like they don't belong. Um, and, you know, we're, the church, I think, has kind of been grappling with the fact that so many people don't feel welcomed and they're making sort of baby steps into having those dialogues and conversations, but it feels that with every step forward, it's almost two steps back. Um, and I mean, particularly in Denver, I'm thinking of, um, I, I think it was the fall 2018, um, a young woman named Alana Faith Chen, um, and who she identified as a lesbian, but um, because of her, she was very close with um, religious in the archdiocese of Denver and ended up completing suicide because she was led to believe that she was worthless um, and, you know, was sinful um, and that God didn't love her and she was evil and it was so much for her to deal with um, and, and eventually she ended her life. We um, invited her mother to speak at our parish last spring and we, it was, I mean, it was heartbreaking to hear the account of her story. And um, undoubtedly, there are trans people who are in that same position who feel like they're not worthy, that they shouldn't be alive, um, and that they're not loved for who they are. And these policies are only worsening that. Um, they're driving people to the point of isolation and desperation and not everyone will end their life but so many people have already and 
it's just so counterintuitive to the church's love of life and their embrace of human dignity. Um, and it's just so worrisome to know that, you know, there are trans youth out there struggling who feel that they can't come out to their parents because um, of how the bishops have guided the faithful to act and believe. And I mean, of course, people, there are always people who disagree and will make their own um, decisions and have their own ideas and views about trans people and um, how to encounter them. But for people who do hold on to the words of Catholic hierarchy, it's very damaging. Um, and it encourages families and parents and adults who have significant roles in um, children and youth, is, youth lives to reject them. And it's creating a lot of hurt and despair. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I have another question for both of you, but I, based on Bob's opening statement, I think it's give you a short answer from Bob at least. So if folks have questions and want to write them down and hold them up, we can come around and pick them up. Um, and then Q&A, or the online folks um, can, can turn them in. But for both of you, um, you know, our, our title here was Building a Church That Excludes No One from Pope Francis. Um, my original question to you was, was do these policies really build a, a church uh, of inclusion? And if Bob said <laughs> you could answer the question no and, and leave. What would be what would be a better approach to fulfilling Francis's vision for this this church? Open that up to you too. Well, I I would say briefly that um, part of the problem with the Catholic Church is that we take decades and centuries to change. And I also think that's one of the great gifts, that we don't, uh, in, in our, the best part of our tradition, we are willing to sit with questions. We're willing to learn. We're willing to tease them out. We're willing to engage people's experiences. Um, I think that's what we need to do. I think we're in a, a learning phase. Uh, I think we're in a phase that, you know, we need to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying through trans and non-binary people, through their families, through the pastoral ministers working with the community, through the theologians, uh, through the entire faithful uh, who, have, who have something to offer to this conversation. Um, discernment is very difficult uh, in that it leaves us without clear answers sometimes, but I would hope that what Catholics would become more um, comfortable with is sitting with the discomfort that we don't have clear answers. And by that, I don't mean we shouldn't do affirmation. I mean, I don't want to suggest that um, the question is, are trans identities valid? But I think the questions we are dealing with are, what do you do when you have a 12-year-old at a Catholic school come out? How do you support that child? What's the best way to do that? How do you acknowledge when someone transitions their role in the faith community, that this person has taken on uh, a more authentic identity, and how do we recognize that liturgically, for instance? So I, I, when I say questions, I don't want to be seen as, you know, whether we should respect trans people when they uh, tell us who they are, but how does the church pastorally serve in its different ministries in ways that are supportive? And I, I just hope we can be willing to take the time to get a good response rather than a quick one. I think um, and one of the more obvious ways for me at least is just going back to scripture and looking at how Jesus calls us to embrace other people. Um, you know, um, in Isaiah we hear, enlarge your tent. Um, and I think by making these spaces bigger and more inclusive and starting there and being more welcoming that's the first step and then you know when we have these people when we have people together we can dialogue and learn from one another 
Um, and that's something the um, Synod on Synodality has really um, reminded me of, is the importance of conversation and dialogue. Um, because I think um, as a transgender person myself, I sometimes am so impatient for the church to just move forward, um, even though I really like what you just said, Bob, about uh, you know how our rich tradition takes the time and we you know, keep coming back to these questions. Um, and throughout the synodal process, I've met so many genuinely amazing people who just don't know what transgender people, um, who they are, um, you know, that we're just like them. We have families and lives and passions too. And really taking the time to talk to them and learn about them and um, their own fears and walking them through that has been a learning experience for me. It's kind of, it's humbled me a little bit. And um, it's really given me the opportunity to grow in my own faith. And so I think when we are following Jesus's call to walk with one another um, and welcome one another, it enriches all of us and it can only make our church and our faith stronger. And also by recognizing too that um, I think a lot of the time when we talk about the church, we put the onus on our um, hierarchy. And um, I mean, and they should be um, making better statements of welcome to people. Um, that's no question, but we are also the church, each one of us. And when we come together too, what we do matters. Um, and it, it's so powerful um, and that's it's the work it's you know we are the hands and feet of God um, and so we have a lot of work to do too um, and so I think you know each taking our own personal responsibility and looking at what that means whether it's educating people in our community or educating ourselves um, or just taking steps to welcome people um, yeah thank you Michael we have questions from... Oh, we have lots of questions. <laughs> uh, do we have questions in the room? Anybody with uh, who filled out cards who wants to pass them in? And we'll... So hold on a minute. We've got so many questions online. We're not going to get to everything, but I'm going to try and do my best to maybe combine a few, you know? But so, so let's start with Kathy Harmon Christian's uh, question here. She says, hello, thank you for this forum. As a parent of a trans person, I've consistently chosen them, but there are so many that struggle. I've tried to dialogue with some priests and bishops, but they really haven't been open to hearing the truth of the lived experience of my child. In the age of synodality, there's this word again, in the age of synodality, the bishops who force their view in documents and policies and procedures are essentially using prejudice and power, which is abuse of power. Here's the question. How do you think we should hold them accountable while also pursuing dialogue and deep listening? Over to you. <laughs> well, uh, man, if I could tell you how to hold a bishop accountable, I've <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would have solved a lot of the church's problems. Um, the one thing I will say, I, and I don't know if it gets to accountability, but um, I think you have to keep knocking at the bishop's door until the bishop is willing to open the door and sit down. And I, I uh, you know, Catholic parents of, of LGBTQ children, I always say are some of the fiercest advocates uh, because they over several decades have refused to give up. They just, you know, in Philadelphia, there's a parents group, they just kept coming back and writing to the bishop, can we meet with you, can we meet with you, can we meet with you? Finally, they got a meeting. Uh, I don't know how productive it was, but um, you, I don't think we know when we sit down and encounter another person what's gonna come of that, but I think we have to be sure that we're creating spaces where church leaders can encounter us uh, whether we're LGBTQ or family members or just uh, concerned allies, 
um, you have to just keep asking for those meetings and making sure whether it's whether and this is also true for your pastors pastoral associates uh, university leaders anyone who's involved in sort of the the Catholic officialdom I think you have to just keep pushing them to meet with you um, sometimes it's right to make demands uh, sometimes it should just be sort of a moment of dialogue to learn about each other's stories and where you're coming from the persistent widow is really coming to mind right now who um, if um, you recall you know the the unjust judge won't um, grant a decision in her favor um, but she keeps coming to him and coming to him and asking him to grant her a just decision um, and I like to imagine you know she's probably following him to around everywhere in his life she's going to work uh, waiting for him like at his um, uh, wagon with his horse later um, just really everywhere until he decides to um, grant her a just decision not because it's right but just to get her off of his back um, which is not to say that um, that's the best reasoning about forgetting forgiving justice or getting justice but it's also a reminder that God will work to create justice um, no matter what and I think also gaining support from others in your community and I know that's not always possible um, but when it is the, the more support you have and the more people who are with you knocking at the door and asking the bishops to talk or asking the priests to talk they're going to have to start listening um, because there's more and more voices and they can't or they shouldn't ignore everyone okay I, I got what I think is a, a quick question here from the floor has any church or diocese come out with a policy that supports LGBTQ plus trans folks? Not in the US, not that I know of in the US. I knew it was the short answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it the church's concern how people identify? Okay. <laughs> I mean, creation is has, is so central to Catholic tradition, um, and we see it. It comes up in so many different parts um, in the liturgy. It comes up um, just in parish life, or if you're in a parochial school, it's just always so present. Um, and I think primarily there's an idea that God creates in binaries, um, you know. Um, but there's this really good book that um, I read a few years ago by, um, he's a trans theologian. He's not a Catholic trans theologian, but he's Christian, and his name is Austin Hartke. And he talks about the fact that God doesn't really create in binaries because there's so much in between um, you know, in Genesis, when we're talking about light and dark, there's still dusk and dawn, those in-between stages, or land and sea. Um, there are still swamps and marshes. Um, there's that gray area. And while it may name those um, extremes, that those, those binaries, there's so much in between. But we don't recognize that. We're not taught to recognize that. Um, and it's just, you know, our theology has impacted how we think and how we um, talk about things and how we view gender, um, among other things. So I think it's just, it, it's another area that um, they, the, the bishops have also latched onto that they know that they can use to um, be in control of the laity too, um, because they know a lot of people won't question it. I want to congratulate you, Michael, on answering a question before I even asked it. <laughs> there, was, there was a question about, um, about uh, trans-friendly theology, and you just did something on that. So a couple of questions I want to uh, pull together here that relate to synodality, right? So um, do you 
does either of you have hope in the synod on synodality processes in creating spaces where trans voices can be more adequately heard and included in the direction of the future of the church? And I'm going to combine that with... Um, I think personal accounts of individuals are very powerful and can move hearts and minds. Are there organizations of trans people who could provide individuals to speak at meetings with accounts of their own life experience in order to promote education and understanding of trans people? So I think the question's about how the voices of trans people can be, can be heard, whether through the Synod on Synodality or some other way. I'll uh, speak briefly to the synod question uh, because I am a, a big advocate of the synodal process right now. I think uh, this is an amazing opportunity for the church, uh, for advocates of uh, reform and renewal, for queer and trans folks. Um, you know, I think there's there's skepticism because we haven't done this before, so each step is sort of a new thing and we're learning and walking together. Uh, but uh, I take a lot of hope from the fact that, um, you know, there were these local sessions and then diocese put together reports based on the local sessions and then the U.S. bishops put together a report and all the national bishops' conferences put together reports, replicated this process. and. Then the Vatican Synod Office put out a report. And it's an interim document. It, doesn't, it's, it has no authority, so to speak. Um, but at all of those points, LGBTQ people could have been weeded out. They could have been you know, removed by the diocese or the bishops. And I'm sure in some cases that happened. But the Vatican document clearly talks about the need for the church to attend to LGBTQ Catholics and, uh, and, and issues of gender and sexuality more generally. I mean, that is, that is a Vatican document coming out and saying, amongst the other issues, the church has many issues to attend to, but we are needing to respond to uh, queer and trans folks and their families in terms of how we be church today. So. I don't know what happens, but I have a lot of hope because so far in the first year or so, we've seen progress made. And to answer the part about um, where you can find uh, trans voices, um, there are quite a few personal stories on the um, New Ways blog bondings that can be shared. Um, there's fortunate families, um, and they have a whole section of writings from transgender Catholics specifically. Um, and then um, Sister Louisa uh, Darwin has, um, she has um, in her work created um, a group of folks who has gone around and done um, different events and programs to share their stories and enlighten people on their journeys and um, to just talk and walk with others. Um, and that's been very successful too. Okay, I got another couple of questions to put together. They're sort of the same, I think. So one, uh, first one says, in what way is the shame felt by LGBTQ plus persons amplified by the church's inability to articulate a healthy theology of sexuality for people of all gender identities? That's one question to do with the, how the church is or is not handling the issue. And then the other question is a little bit more historical. What do you believe is the connection, if any, with the Protestant Puritan conservative foundations of the country and its impact on our own societal views of this issue. So the church and the, I guess, the dominantly Protestant, Protestant culture. <laughs> well, I think um, the puritanical culture definitely has shaped a lot of um, our 
framework around sexuality and gender in our nation. Um, and we, st we still are feeling the effects of that today. Um, and certainly within the um, theology of the Catholic Church, um, or at least the theology that leaders are choosing to um, stick with. Um, but, and I think that, so that does, it, it creates so much shame around um, being different, especially in regard to sexuality or gender. Um, and we're just made to feel very uncomfortable being different. Um, and we're told that that's wrong and it's um, all of that internalized shame it just comes out in so many ways and we're seeing negative effects of it all the time. Um, to speak to the question about theology and, and um, connections with maybe Protestantism, um, you know, I, it's a whole other panel to talk about, I think today, how Christianity, Christian nationalism, right-wing uh, sort of ideologies, fascism, these things uh, are coming out of uh, toxic theology. And, um, you know, Catholics are right there in it, both Catholics in the pews and some church leaders. Um, so I think that's its own question. Uh, what I will say about that is uh, clearly the, the right wing has found that trans people are an easy scapegoat to use as a wedge issue uh, politically, that most people don't know a, a trans person or, or they don't know that they know a trans person really. Um, this is confusing to people. It challenges sort of fundamental assumptions that we're socialized to believe, that there's just men and women and you know other myths like that. Um, so it, it becomes an easy issue because it's confusing to people. It causes fear of the unknown, all of these things. Um, and for Catholics, I, I think as we move forward as a nation, uh, that is why it's so important for our church to get this right, because we have a civic responsibility to push back against a lot of the anti-transgender work that is happening sort of in civil society. Okay, we have a, a slightly different question here. So. How does the church account for those who were, quote, born both, unquote? So medically and scientifically, the numbers are small. And this, this uh, Didi Tostanowski is asking this question. She says, until recently, parents or medical professionals made the decision regarding which gender to select. Now it is more common to avoid a surgical correction and allow the individual to mature as a both person and make any choice him or herself as adults. Does the church have anything to say about this? Um, some of the policies do acknowledge uh, the reality that there are intersex people, um, and basically intersex folks in, in sort of the bishop's estimation are treated as uh, exceptions that prove the rule, uh, rather than uh, something that would challenge us to think maybe the binary isn't real. They sort of say, well, there is this group of people and that's how we know that the male and female is so strong, um, is sort of the two options. Um, one thing I would, I would say in terms of our theology of the church that needs to, what we need to account for when discussing gender is, um, you know, gender identity is, is uh, more f fluid, social construct, that kind of stuff. But assigned sex is also a social construct. I mean, when you talk about a sex of, uh, the sex of a child, uh, these are just medical norms, right? This is, we have created the idea that this is what makes someone male and this is what makes someone female. And when a baby is born, it's a reductionist sort of, what is the genitalia? And that's how you decide, or the genitalia is ambiguous. And thankfully, our medical uh, procedures are moving away from, um, sort of uh, violating surgeries. Um, but, you know, I, I would guess that if people's hormone levels, chromosomes, all, all kinds of things beyond just genitalia, internal reproductive organs, I've, if people were studied, we'd find that I think a lot of people uh, 
don't quite fit exactly into these male female boxes that there's a lot more of a spectrum and a lot greater diversity in terms of how we are created um, and our theology Catholic theology just doesn't account for that we, we I, official theology the, the church teaching there are theologians getting to that I have a, a question here for you Michael um, it's probably a question you get every time something like this happens. So Jocelyn Cullen would like to know, how do you stay in the Roman Catholic Church when there is so much transphobia, especially from the clergy and bishops? Yeah, I do get it. That's a very <laughs> common question. <laughs> um, so um, I had actually a realization um, back in the spring of 2021 when um, the document was released um, about not blessing uh, same-sex marriages because um, it, they're sin and you can't bless sin. And, you know, so many people were reaching out to me um, and asking how I stay and, you know, why. Um, and more so, how, you know, how do I reconcile? Because I think that's like the bigger question behind why you stay is how do you reconcile your faith and your identity? And I really came to the realization that I don't reconcile because I just, I am me. Um, I know church teaching, I'm informed on church teaching, but I'm also equally informed um, on the science of being transgender, the psychology, um, sociology, um, societal norms, and um, the LGBT community, and you know, all together with guided by my primacy of conscience, I'm choosing what is healthy for me um, because I'm not going to live in a state of despair and feel, um, you know, wrong about being. I'm not going to sub subject myself to being in um, a body that doesn't feel like mine. Um, and I'm not going to feel bad for that because I know the consequences. Um, and I'm going to embrace myself and be authentically me because authenticity is so important in our relationship with God. Um, we have to be able to be fully ourself and embrace ourselves as God created us um, to have that loving relationship with God. And so I came to the realization that I don't have to reconcile my faith and gender because I, I'm just me and I'm Catholic and it, my faith is a huge part of my life. And so that's why I stay because I love our deep and rich traditions um, I admire our theology and, you know, caring for people, caring for the sick, for the, for the poor, um, for the outcast, because they're, that theology is so rich that encourages us to welcome. Our scripture is very clear in calling us to do for others and live for others. Um, and I love being part of that and I love being part of the body of Christ and I wouldn't change that for anything. So that's why I stay. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so I, I, I'm gonna, I got one more question here, okay? Is that right, Kevin? Yep. And, uh, but apologies to those whose questions have not got answered or not directly answered. So here's the, the last question we have here from Caitlin Merritt. It's a bit long, but there's a question at the end of it. Given that we know the deep psychological and emotional harm as well as economic harm and physical harm, self-caused or otherwise, that results from practices of misgendering, dead naming, shutting down opportunities, etc., is this a matter of cognitive acrobatics on the side of parishes perpetuating these practices? With the exceptions you name, it seems as though the theology of social justice is more or less forgotten. How can trans, -Cath I think this is the real question, how can trans Catholics and allies work to center dignity, justice, 
and the protection and raising up of vulnerable populations in these conversations. Um, I, I think the questioner is, is entirely correct that um, we have a choice as Catholics because we have multiple parts that we can draw from in the tradition. And on the one hand, you have sort of sexual and gender ethics and these teachings uh, that tend to be less affirming. Uh, on the other hand, you have that rich social justice tradition. And there's sort of a tension between the two. In making decisions about how to proceed, uh, and this is the case in, in many things in our lives, you, you have to choose between goods, basically. You have to choose what's the primary lens I'm going to view the situation in front of me from. And I think Catholics um, need to choose the, the lens of social justice, that when you're looking at the question of uh, trans equality, uh, when you're deciding what principles am I going to draw from, what parts of the faith tradition are most relevant here, you've got to lean on that, that social teaching. And I mentioned earlier uh, the New Zealand bishops put out their policy, and, and really that's what they did. That's why it's so good is they, they treated it as a social justice issue. And um, I'll just quote, this is from the New Zealand bishops, how we as a church treat those members of the LGBTQIA plus community should reflect Catholic social teaching. So you can only imagine what US diocesan policies would be like if they took that approach. Um, so on, on the whole LGBTQ plus spectrum, take social justice, but specifically we're talking about these diocesan policy, policies. Imagine if the first question you ask is, how can the church be in right relationship with its trans members and the larger uh, trans community in the world? Keep, ampl keep amplifying transgender voices because we're not, we're not, um, voiceless we're just silenced and um so part of that is empowering trans people um to speak their truth and creating spaces where they're safe to do so where they're not threatened um with either violence or verbal assault um so keep amplifying their, our voices thank you both um, before we close, um, I'm wondering if by way of, of closing out your, your statements here, um, I could pose this to each of you, right? To the trans youth out there, some of whom are sitting in Catholic schools, they don't know these policies are happening, right? They're just trying to be themselves in a place that's supposed to be safe and <laughs> encourage their, their development or to Catholic parents of trans youth who are just trying to love their children the way God is, is encouraging them to love their children. What can we say to them as the Catholic Church? That the church is, um, and I, I know I already touched on this earlier, but the church is more than just the bishops and the priests who are making these statements. The church is us, and that, you know, there are so many people who love and embrace you, um, even though, even if it's not visible at the moment. Um, there is a community out there, and we are working to build it, and I think what's important is also inviting them to build not just the kingdom of God, but the kingdom um, together with, with tr other trans people and allies and uh, eventually it will become more Catholics, more and more, um, as people encounter one another and learn about our truths. Uh, so I may do something unpopular given we've been talking about how problematic the U.S. bishops are, but I would answer this question by actually quoting a U.S. bishop, um, because I think this is, uh, you know, the message that the church should be saying to people, all kinds of people who feel themselves marginalized by, by our ecclesial policies and practices. Uh, 
Washington, D.C.'s Cardinal Wilton Gregory was at a Theology on Tap event, uh, and a trans-Catholic basically asked him, you know, what's the church doing about me? Like, what's, you know, where do I fit in? And uh, Cardinal Gregory said, uh, told this person, you are at the very heart of the church, and the church is your family, and there is always room for you, and we don't want you to go anywhere. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, the bishops get a bad rap, uh, but I think we should be looking for those church leaders, whether they're formal or informal people in our communities, who can make elevate that message in very public ways. Uh, so I, I don't know that I would say it, but I think, you know, asking your pastor to say something positive about trans people in a homily, saying just God loves you, uh, could go a long way. It's not the end result. We need to do much, much better. But I think as a starting point, just saying you are at the heart of the church and we want you here is sort of the baseline we need to get to. Thank you both. Thank you for, for joining us and sharing of yourselves with us. Um, thank you all for joining us here and, and on Zoom. And thank you, Dr. Lakeland, for inviting this conversation here. Yeah, wonderful. Evening.